I'm Todd LaFelt, Managing Director of User Experience at Huge in Los Angeles. Uh, and I've been um, at Huge for pretty close to nine years. Uh, I've been working in digital for about 20 years. Um, How do I do that? Great. Great. This is better. OK. Hi. Now you can hear me a little bit better. Um, when I was trying to decide on a topic to talk about today, I started to think about uh, where real innovation is going to come from and what's going to impact us as designers. Um, and I believe there's a, uh, a wave of disruption that's coming um, that's going to force us to rethink the way that we design. The patterns and the tropes that we rely on today are at some point going to be outdated and start to fail us. So today, innovation in technology and business is happening like super fast. And as a result, we spend a lot of time trying to make sense of the present um, and what's happening right now. And in some ways, this makes us more of a reactionary discipline. So to look ahead and understand what's really going to affect us as designers, we need a way to peek into the future. So for most of us, especially for our clients, millennials are seen as the future. At Huge, we spend a ton of time uh, thinking about millennials, learning about how they behave and what they care about. And something that makes them very real to me and at the same time incredibly frustrating to many marketers is, in short, they are full of contradictions. They're complex, very real people who aren't easily manipulated by media. So why do we really care? Millennials are seen as the trendsetters and early adopters of our time. They're a key consideration for any business looking to future-proof themselves in this new digital economy. But what's next? What happens when, turn the sound out, what happens when uh, the next generation becomes the new trendsetters? So how many people in the audience have kids? So for those of you that do, you're probably going to know what I'm about to talk about. So this is my son. He is uh, 21 months old. And in general, we try to keep screens away from him. Uh, but in the limited time that he's had access to these things and just held them, he's learned mostly through observation that these devices are the most valuable, powerful objects in the room. Um, his toys pale in comparison to what he sees these things do in our hands. And he wants in really badly. And for my son and the millions of other toddlers around the world, we don't know how this exposure to interactive screens is going to affect them. You, you've probably seen these videos. The kid on the left thinks he's controlling the TV like an iPad, and the little girl on the right thinks that the magazine is like an iPad. Um, so to amplify the gravity of this, most millennials still remember a lot of these things. And it blows my mind that to, to think that my parents were totally wowed by a lot of these. Even the triptych, does anybody here remember the triptych? Oh, yeah. Like how cool was it that my father could call AAA and just tell them where we wanted to go and he would get his own personalized special map. Um, <laughs> and I, I can't even imagine explaining some of these things to my son. Like they already seem entirely archaic. So we wanted to see if we could learn more about um, this post-millennial generation. And one thing we quickly realized was there's no shortage of attempts to name them. Um, given the importance of millennials to business, there's more attention than ever before to try to make sense of what's next. And so you can see some of the themes here. The two big ones clearly are technology and conflict. And there's no clear winner right now. It's just too early and their identities are still being formed. Um, but whatever uh, we decide to, to call them ultimately, we decided um, why not speak to them firsthand. So we did some research. We conducted several focus groups and one-on-ones with a diverse uh, group of six to 12-year-olds. And we looked at this age group uh, because technically anyone under the age of 13 belongs to the next generation. So anyone who's 13 and above is technically a millennial. And uh, here are just uh, a few key insights. And it's important to note that these are super early findings. We just did this research. Um, and just a kind of a sneak peek at some of the things that stood out for us. And our team is has actually published a white paper this past I think it was July, that focused on uh, the behaviors of digital kids. And they're working on another white paper based on this recent research that's going to break these uh, I ideas down a little bit more. Uh, and that should come out in a few weeks and will be published to the uh, huge ideas area of our uh, website. Um, and I'm really curious to hear what you guys think, so feel free to corner me afterwards. OK, so uh, this first insight is kind of a no-brainer, but it needs to be said. We Obviously knew this going in, however, um, I think we underestimated how this would affect our research. Has anyone here ever done research with six-year-olds? 
Okay, so some of you might understand. Um, some of the kids were super fidgety, couldn't sit still for their life, let alone have a conversation. Um, a few of them were like tragically shy, uh, and we couldn't even pick them up on the microphones. And we made the mistake of putting a bunch of candy out. So for the first session, all we could hear was like rappers and these kids crunching hard candy in their mouths. Um, but another point to make about kids being kids, and this is also a no-brainer, they're not like us. We need to acknowledge some of the things that affect their behavior before we make any giant conclusions. And surprise, they've got tons of free time and they play a lot, like hours and hours and hours. They also don't have free access to information. They rely a lot on their parents uh, for devices, logins, passwords, and of course, money to buy apps, music, sneakers. Um, and this last point really stood out for us. Their brains aren't fully baked yet. We are not child development experts but we quickly saw that there was a pretty big difference between our age groups. The, um, the, the last two, I'm sorry, the two age groups that we studied straddled the last two of Piaget's development stages. The younger kids didn't have the ability to wrap their heads around some of the questions that we even asked them. So at one point we asked them what's cool, expecting them to talk about fashion or music or a, a friend in class, and they responded, a refrigerator, a pool. Um, so we quickly uh, realized that we had to treat these age groups differently in our research. We also realized this affected a lot of their behavior in digital, but one of the biggest themes we saw across all ages was these kids are natural born hackers. So what do we mean by that? First, they're amazingly naive and fearless. They didn't have any legacy baggage like we all have as to why something should or shouldn't work. They weren't constrained by any rules and they were incredibly resilient in their pursuit of figuring out how something works. And I would say that probably about 98% of their activity centered around games. Um, a lot of great lessons can come from games. Problem solving and logic, pattern recognition, dealing with frustration, even teamwork. And the best example of this was Minecraft. Every kid we spoke with was obsessed with Minecraft. And some of them have been playing it for years. So Minecraft is sometimes referred to as a sandbox. The game allows these kids to build their own worlds and engage with each other in a bunch of different ways. There are also tons of mods or modifications uh, that are created by different users. Uh, they um, allow these kids to alter their worlds and they create these endless variations with all kinds of emergent possibilities. So what we noticed was hacking the game is actually part of playing the game itself. And overall, what we really saw was these kids are essentially learning how to master and defeat a system or a set of rules. Their efforts to figure something out were really done by any means necessary. In a way, there weren't any rules at all, and each system had a new set of constraints to push and test and try to break, and we saw this kind of a, a thrill at pushing the boundaries. Um, and none of this was seen as cheating. It was all just part of the game. And we realized that this experience was really setting a new tone for how they approached other things in their life as well. So we saw kids hacking different aspects of their lives. We saw kids figuring out ways to save their parents' credit cards so they didn't have to constantly ask them uh, when they wanted to buy something. Um, they were strategizing about who to send Snapchats to and who not to send Snapchats to in their groups at school. So one kid hacked his mother's iPad and created like a secret hidden folder where he kept all his apps and games. Um, and overall, the big insight for us was it, it really looked like their experience with games had the potential to influence almost everything that they did. Another thing that stood out for us was the words that they used. As UX designers, we spend a ton of time defining content systems, creating labeling systems, and finding structures. And these kids are naturally picking up what we're putting down uh, and without thinking about it. They're casually using these words in sentences and in their search queries. And I think we were all stunned when these words just kind of came out of their mouths and didn't seem forced at all. We've spent months working with uh, companies that are spending millions of dollars trying to demystify the cloud and explain it to adults. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen IBM's recent uh, cloud commercials. You should probably check that out and see what I mean. Um, these kids, without even stopping to think about it, rattled off these amazingly simple, uncomplicated answers like it was nothing. So this next one, kid goggles, is meant to be sort of like beer goggles. It's this idea that a lot of these sophisticated content targeting systems we use can create a sort of a self-reinforcing uh, vacuum or a merry-go-round that you can't quite get off of. 
The illustration here is actually taken from a New York Times article written in 2011, and it was called The Trouble with the Echo Chamber Online, and was about how we enter in these controlled worlds that eliminate serendipity and surprise. Watching kids browse for content really seems to illustrate this point. For the younger kids we spoke with, they seemed to find themselves locked in this hellish world of food and animals. And this wasn't just for games. So a lot of the commercials that get retargeted to them are for cereal and food drinks. I'm sorry, fruit drinks. Um, and as they get older, there's a, a much more profound gender split. The boys get stuck in a more dark, masculine world um, that's more violent, first-person shooter games, and a ton of zombie games. And the girls get it the worst. The games for them are usually kept in this kind of a, it's like a girl's ghetto. And it's usually titled like, Games for Girls. Um, and some of the games, uh, sorry, the names of the games really say it all. Forest Fairy Queen, Adopt a Kitty, School Crush, Kelly's Summer Jobs. So a lot of these games seem to be, be about following instructions, decorating, or, or just being helpful. <laughs> so to further illustrate this point, and this is something I'm sure you're all, uh, you all have experience with, especially working in this industry and moving from project to project, this is my YouTube page after doing some of the research. Um, all the content is now about games. So we saw these kids get stuck in this echo chamber that reinforced these gender roles and has the potential to eliminate exposure to a lot of new and different ideas. Next, we saw a lot of kids who were giant fans of what adults would call everyday people. First, it's really important to say that kids treated YouTube like TV. They didn't really differentiate. And when we asked them, uh, what shows do you watch? They replied with a mix of TV shows and YouTube shows. So the word TV means less and less since many of the shows the kids are watching, they can actually just get on YouTube. Almost every kid rapidly tuned in to watch specific shows on YouTube, and, and YouTube is creating some amazingly big stars. Um, My Life as Eva has over a million followers. That's a big reach. Eva talks about uh, a bunch of different things. But she has these uh, videos that she calls haul videos, H-A-U-L. Is everybody familiar with what they are? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's like, what did you haul back from the store? Um, and it's basically like an unboxing from this teenager's massive shopping spree. And I, I think many of these kids like the programs because they talk about stuff that's relevant to them. Um, and in a way, it's, it's much more casual and relatable than TV programming is. This is another example of how our notion of celebrity is changing. In Seattle, 11,000 people got together to watch a video game competition for a game called Dot2. This was a, a, a competition where there was an $11 million in total prize money being awarded. Twitch was recently acquired by Amazon for $970 million. Twitch is a platform where you can play games, but you can also watch people play games. Uh, they claim that 45 million people use the site every month. So the big question is, will gaming become a legitimate spectator sport? And are these going to be the next global megastars? This next insight is particularly uh, poignant to us as designers. And kids routinely glossed over text and went straight to images. And while images are very important, aesthetics are clearly not a concern. Kids are surprisingly functional and task-oriented browsers. And all these kids. Um, uh, I'm sorry, all the hard to navigate sites filled with blinding primary colors are actually seen as signs that this content is for them. So for those of you who haven't seen some of these, uh, these are just a few examples of some of the, the game interfaces. This is like a typical category page for games. There are a, a lot of people today that talk about how kids live more transparent lives uh, and aren't concerned about um, their privacy. We saw uh, something different. Um, these kids are very aware and are deeply concerned about who sees their personal information. So we asked them, if your mom or dad could buy you any device in the world, which one would you ask for? Surprisingly, the idea of being able to choose any phone um, from in, in the universe wasn't clearly, uh, I'm sorry, wasn't nearly as exciting as the idea of having your own. Um, a phone that they didn't have to share a private space that was safe from their brothers and sisters and from their parents' prying eyes. So what could all this mean for us as designers? Here are a few just early, uh, early ideas. In the future, clearly people will own fewer things like CDs, DVDs, books, and stuff like that. 
And perhaps this will make them think more about which objects they really value. Maybe what they do decide to own and value will be more unique, one of a kind or rare objects. Perhaps people also value experiences more than owning a lot of physical things. The device battle between Apple, Samsung, and Android will disappear, and screens will be seen simply as ways to get information and your stuff. Your content and apps will be the most important. The prolifer proliferation of dumb screens will explode today. Um, will explode, sorry, today's challenges in designing for context um, and a million screen sizes. The glut of digital assets we create in a lifetime will be beyond our ability to personally manage. So dig digital asset management will start even before babies are born. So parents are gonna need to consider available domains and wrestle with the implications of, of giving their kid a name like John Smith versus Blue Ivy Carter. Automated curation and prioritization tools for our music, our photos, our emails, tickets, bank statements, taxes, medical information will all be essential and services like Google Stories Facebook's My Year will grow to become tools that we, every, that we use every day just to get by. Users will become expert searchers who know how to create any query and find anything they want, thus eliminating the need for complicated click-through tiered browsing experiences. And this last possible implication is one I'm most excited and hopeful about. As this next generation continues to game their hearts out, they will be secretly building skills that will help us to reach the final frontier of the design revolution. And eventually, they'll discover ways to bring convenience and simplicity to some of today's most archaic, bloated, frustrating, and complicated experiences. So these are just some of the mo uh, both terrifying and exciting things that we all have to look forward to uh, in the future. And I'm really glad I had the opportunity to share some of today's ideas with you. Thanks. If anybody has any questions, shoot. Anybody have any water? Oh, hey. A lot of the presentation was very optimistic, and at the very end, you dropped the word terrifying. Can you elaborate on what you said? So I, I think um, when we were working on this, what was terrifying for us was um, what it meant for us as designers. And I think one of the ideas is that over time, a lot of these uh, the generation of users today, as they users today of the game Minecraft, are now designers of the game Minecraft. So there was this idea that at some point, our role would be diminished as decision makers. Um, and also, when you look at uh, the, the power of what search can do to destroy a lot of the work that we do to create these finding structures, and I don't mean destroy in, <laughs> I don't mean destroy in a bad way, uh, disrupt, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, is, it changes the world quite dramatically. Uh, I mean, potentially, all we will have is a massive repository of content um, that you can call up through, basically, queries. So I think that's what I meant by this, this terrifying notion. And I think, you know, there were some very hopeful, positive aspects about this um, research and what the implications might be. But also, you know, and also there are some, some negative side effects that we see around um, what some of these devices are having uh, on kids. I mean, we personally try to keep screens away from our kids as much as possible, our kid <laughs> as much as possible, sorry. Um, only have one. But, uh, you know, and, and it's something that, there's an article today in the New York Times, I think it was New York Times, about how Steve Jobs actually um, didn't let his, gave his kids very minimal screen time. I mean, I think it's really unknown what this is going to do to our, our, our kids' brains. Um, and uh, again, how that ladders up to the interactions and the experiences we're gonna be designing. Cool. Oh. Um, did you get any mention about the behavior of the children? Like, for example, they were very fidgety or very quiet. And do you feel like that had something to do with their interaction with devices today rather than students? I don't know. I mean, <coughs> like I said, I'm not a child uh, development specialist. Um, I would have to say no, like any kid, even outside of a context of doing research, and there's always this kind of artificial aspect when you're doing research, you know? The kid goes to a strange place with his parents, he's asked to sit in a room on his chair, he's being, you know, videotaped. Um, kids are, are naturally fidgety, and I think what we saw was the kids that came in that were six and seven were just much more fidgety and much more challenged with responding to some of the questions, and then as soon as you got to like 
10 and 11, they were just like much more articulate and reflective and able to answer questions that were, and, and to sit still, <laughs> but able to answer questions about the future and speculate, um, which I thought was, to me, that's just kind of a natural developmental stage. So I'm not sure how much that had to do with the devices, although I wouldn't rule that out. Cool, thanks.